Hey, welcome to a very, very special episode of the Vitality Hour. And I think nobody gives that word vitality uh, more juice than you, my brother. Today we have uh, Justin Dodge, and he is a sergeant of SWAT, Denver, and has an extraordinary story to share pre recent events and then an even more extreme story to share. And um, I see you as a brother of another mother. And when we first met and started getting to become friends, um, your values and what's important in life is really where I think we connected. And this desire to serve is what I feel pour out of you. You give a crap about other people, your wife, your kids, other people's kids, society, and you do that through SWAT. And you asked me what SWAT stands for, and I fumbled through special weapons and tactics, and you said, actually, SWAT stands for saving lives. And what I appreciate is the clarity in what you do with your life, what your purpose is. And we run a clinic of mystery and chronic illness. And our job is trying to graduate people with chronic illness back to a creative, productive, functional life where they can reclaim the simple tasks, cleaning up their house and running a household to entrepreneurial ideas, just holding a job to taking care of aging parents, being moms and dads with brains that work and everything in between. And it is a huge undertaking to take someone who has 30, 35 uh, healthcare symptoms and help get them back diagnostics and lifestyle change and nutritional changes and finding underlying causes. And sometimes things like dealing with a water damaged moldy crawl space or learning how to use a CPAP or saving up money for removing a dental abscess. I mean, the journey is arduous and my biggest uh, purpose of having you on the podcast is to help rub off on society and say, yeah, it's hard and you can. And I would love you to just introduce who you are and share that crazy day in Denver that most of Colorado knows about. Unfortunately. Rest, unfortunately, but maybe the rest of the world needs to hear about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, first off, thank you for having me on the show. Um, this is cool. And yeah, an organic friendship that was made in Steve Hess's gym with us just coming up, chatting with each other, and and this took off. So, so thank you for having me on. And um, I always love being able to share my story when I know it's going to be productive and help people because it's something that's been part of my life forever, and it's now taking on like a life of its own in a different way. Um, but. Like you said, I've been, I've been a police officer for 28 years. I've been part of Denver. The Denver Police Department has a full-time tactical unit. It's called the Metro SWAT unit. And I've been fortunate enough to be assigned to that unit for almost 19 years. Um, I've been a technician. I've been a corporal, which is kind of like an assistant team leader. And then I've been a sergeant there for almost 12 years, um, which is like a team leader role. So, yeah. Um, which which part which part you want to talk about first? Well, I you remember I was kind of drooling a little bit with SWAT because yeah. I I told you the story of how I got potty trained. Yep. And my brother, who was uh, Peter Dorninger, who's just a total stud and one of my beacons of honesty and being a great dad and just being an amazing, humble human being, he got a toy M sixteen mm -hmm. for cleaning up the rec room. And I, and we watched SWAT. I don't know if you remember the TV show oh, yeah. and, and, oh, yeah. and the whole deal. And I wanted an M16 and my mom's, I was still in diapers, just turning three. And she's like, if you want a M16, go and sit on that potty. I literally went upstairs, pulled out my diaper, sat on the toilet, got my M16 and was potty trained. So I love uh, it. SWAT has been, um, you know, just this, and I'm sure it's a little more masculine, but this dreamy kind of, these guys just come in and kick ass when shit hits the fan yeah. um, phenomenon in my young adolescent brain. And then later in my life, riding with the ambulance and being an EMT, realizing w we were taught um, a dead EMT helps nobody. Right. And that you should not go into a scene until it's cleared. 
and there's levels to clearance. And when SWAT comes in, it's like you really aren't going to help anyone EMT if you don't have the services to, to stabilize the situation. And I think sharing um, what happened that day on what was supposed to be and, and still is a, a celebrated day when the Denver Nuggets parade came, came through town. But with a huge crowd like that, there's always danger for everyone involved. Every every massive crowd that I've ever been a part of um, brings its own its own individual unique senses of danger. Um, and there there are so many. But let me let me back up real quick and kind of tell you kind of how I got how how I not not the actual like rigors of the test or that kind of stuff, but the the idea or the notion of me getting to getting to Metro. Um, so when your, your listeners hear me refer to Metro, I don't talk about SWAT a lot. I usually say Metro because mm -hmm. that's what our unit's called. Um, so kind of touching on, on your story, my dad, my grandfather was military, my, and then he went on to become a chief of police, was law enforcement for 40 years. Father, military, um, ended up being a chief of the, United States Marshal Service. He was a chief deputy, and my dad's now passed, so I can I can I can tell this story without without worries. But they used to have a system where they were allotted a certain amount of ammunition with with the Marshal Service, uh, and that ammunition had to be used twice a year. And because of how busy they were and all the different things that they had, there was oftentimes I would say more often than not they would have a massive amount of ammunition that had to be used within about a month prior to the to the biannual you know allotment so my dad was also part of the u.s marshal sog which is a special operations group which is, is one of the national tactical units um he was a chief deputy at the time so he was more he was more there and went through the training as kind of like a Hey, we want you to see what we're doing. But he did get all the equipment. They had all of the weapon systems. So I have incredibly fond memories of my little brother and I. And my dad would take his work truck and go to the office. He'd bring us to the office and he would load automatic M16s. We'd have three different kinds of MP5s. If anybody knows, like an HK MP5, we even had like the PDWs. Um, we had mini Uzis, we had, we had mini 14s, um, we had eight seventies that were cut off to maybe four inch barrels because my dad was also with, um, the witness protection program. So a lot of the things they needed to do had to be incredibly covert. So they needed high powered weapons that also were incredibly concealable. So bring on the H key there, the HK PDW and, and some of those types of things. And we had a farm of a close family friend that was south of Minneapolis, about an hour south. And my dad would get a big cup of coffee, get a couple of newspapers, and he would take us down to the farm. He was very good about teaching us firearm safety rules and all that kind of sure. stuff. And we would have thousands and thousands and thousands of rounds of ammunition, automatic weapons, we had our eyes and our ears. We knew our four firearm safety rules, and he would just let us go for the afternoon. And we would set up all sorts of drills on our own. And so, so growing up, my day would consist of, you know, several times a year of going down and seeing how many mag dumps I could do with you know 30 round mags on, a, on an hk or an ar-15 or, or or whatever it was so it's funny you bring that story up with yeah. with your toy m16 yeah i was doing that for <laughs> real with my real m16 which uh, which i find are that's the way most of my friends who are super comfortable with um um guns and responsible gun owners they grew up with oversight but also just being comfortable you know and, and absolutely 
I'm going to share that. Well, my youth feels a little lame now. We were smuggling German M80s when I would go over to Austria to visit my relatives. <laughs> and, and that was all in a pre-9-11 world. Yeah. And they were these M80s that didn't have a wick. They had a like a, a, end, end, of a end of a match strike. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, all my friends still have their, their, their fingers. Their fingers. All but, their digits. Yeah, but that's about as lucky as we got. And, yeah. And, and, and that's what you want. You don't want... U.S. Marshals dumping all of their ammo because it's supposed to stay, like that's. But then, right, ammunition expires and yeah. it's got to get burned off. So what exactly. a lucky, what so, a lucky so, childhood. So yeah, so I so I was exposed to that, and and that's kind of what I grew up with. But then when it came time to actually decide what my career path was, yeah, my mom was a teacher. I always wanted to be a teacher, so I actually went to 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 school to become a teacher. And growing up, I was a kid with massive amounts of drive yet i didn't have i'll use the word purpose right now because i now understand more about my life but i didn't have a lot of direction um i knew i loved sports i knew i loved physical fitness i knew i loved being part of groups and teaching um but if it wasn't important to me then it it was whatever i i i can tell you and i'm not proud of this i barely barely graduated high school. I mean, like my dad begged one of my math teachers to at least give me a D so I could walk across the stage because my grandparents were coming into town. And, and I get what you mean by that, but I think it's so important for today's youth to mm -hmm. know if you were a derelict or you weren't the smartest kid in school, that, that high school is nothing. It is. Relative to where life can go and passion and discipline and creativity and productivity that that can come later for some versus you know my son where my older son's like so dialed into film and going off to film school and and he's a rare he's an oddity in that he knows what he wants to do yeah you know so i i love that you're this success but the world knows Hey, dude, I was like fuddy duddy in high school. I didn't have much of a direction. Abs and, absolutely. And kind of resonated with teaching, which I think makes a great foundation for, for police, as does therapists and a whole bunch of other ideas. But Absolutely. But yeah, I love when people, like anyone, when you look to someone who's successful and you're like, oh, it's always that way, right? No, like 99% not. Absolutely not. You know. So I, so because I wanted to be a teacher, I'm going to school become a teacher, um, I'm in college, I'm playing college football, I get hired for the summer to work at um, my mom's basically summer camp, summer, summer school. And because I'm this big college football player young, they put me with a group of special needs kiddos. I'm not the primary teacher, of course, because I don't have the degrees yet or anything like that. Um, but I'm in the classroom with the special need kids when we're out on the playground. I'm with them when we go to field trips. When we're doing whatever it is, that's my job is to be with these kiddos. And I fell in love with these kids. But mm -hmm. what I realized is as the summer progressed that my goals and desires for my daily tasks with these kiddos was less on the educational side. And I was starting to grow very not just comfortable but had this desire to protect and all of a sudden my gear started to change and i realized I, i'm it's in the blood it's in the blood <laughs> i i'm here i'm here not to teach these kids i'm here yeah. to to be a guardian yeah and when we'd go on field trips i would literally the the best way i could put it is i would i was that I was the, the male lion standing in the middle of the pride yeah. and looking out and making sure nobody, nobody is going to come close to these kids. All of them are going to be accounted for, and I will do whatever it takes in order to make sure that these kids return home in the same or even better condition than when they came to school that day. Mm -hmm. And I got a sense of pride from it. And all of a sudden, I realized that that was a purpose. I, I, I developed over that summer, I developed a purpose in life. Mm -hmm. So now I had this massive drive, which I've had as long as I can remember, I've had this drive, but also now I had a purpose. So I consider drive like an engine. 
massive mm-hmm. amounts of horsepower. But if you don't have anything to attach it to, if you don't have that transmission to attach it to, you're literally spinning your wheels. Mm. Well, now I have this purpose that I can attach to this drive and I put the whole thing together. And by doing that, I go in, I, t- I have to tell my dad, hey, I, it's gonna be another year of college and I apologize. My parents were very gracious in helping me with, with going through school. Um, and they saw the drive and they were just waiting for the purpose. So my dad was very cool that I was gonna have to spend another year in college. Um, obviously he, he was a phenomenal person, just like my mom was. They didn't care what I was doing. They just wanted me to be a good human, mm-hmm. um, which is kind of how I've, I've raised my kids. And I ended up graduating in my major, now that I switch majors, with a 3.8 in college because this was not important to me. This was, this was, yes, this is what I want to do. I want to be a protector. I want to be a guardian. I want to go into the law enforcement realm. So once I did that, got hired with the Denver Police Department, we can talk about more of that later, um, get there and one of the days there's these guys and they're at the scenario house and they don't look like they certainly don't look like us as recruits and they don't look like any police officer that i've seen and this is late 90s before massive amounts of internet and that kind of stuff so you see maybe a tv show or something like this and i'm realizing these are swat guys and where i came from there was no such thing as a full-time unit i didn't understand the difference between the different tiers of tactical levels and that kind of stuff and so when i found out that denver metro was a full-time tactical team with my drive with my purpose all those kinds of things is like i want whatever i'm going to do i'm going to be the best at it and if i've chosen the life of law enforcement and i want to protect people i want to save lives the top way for me to do that in my opinion is for me to be in Metro. And I was told, you don't know anybody on the department. You are coming from Minneapolis. You weren't a cadet. You have no chance of getting to Metro. And it was like, okay. Challenge yes, noted. <laughs> perfect. Thank you. That's exactly what I needed. And I had to take, it, it took three times and I watched very close friends and ended up being long, long, long time teammates go before I did. Um, and that was a reality check and, and it made me dig deep into my soul to figure out, do you have what it takes, not just to get to the unit, but to be patient while you're waiting to get to the unit and to do the right things. And, uh, some, some lessons were learned in, in that 18 months of waiting to eventually get to the unit. But, uh, yeah, once I got there, I, I, I have not worked a day in my life in the last 19 years because I'm in a career that not only is challenging, exciting, fun, but it's fulfilling my purpose on a daily basis and making it so that I feel like I'm making an impact. Amazing. And it reminds me, I know you're a jiu-jitsu player and, and it reminds me of like, I'm the perennial blue belt and the goal isn't the goal in getting the squad is almost like getting your black belt. I imagine it is right. But that's when the journey starts. Absolutely. That's when you really know your demons and how you interact with society. And are you a millisecond too slow? And you know, all of our bodies are aging and do I still have the physical criteria and you know, constant daily of being switched on. Yeah. To do your job right. Yeah. It's not like, and again, every job's important in society, but if you mess up a latte at Starbucks, no one's losing a life over it. You Correct. Know, you might get a grumpy uh, customer saying this tastes sour, but what is it? What, what, what was it? So now you're on, uh, on Metro and then you're doing cool things, rewarding things, big things, scary things you know, still have that concern of, do I get to come home to my family every day as anyone at at that level of tactical team does. And we have this, uh, what I called accident and you called incident happen Correct on the day of the Nuggets parade. Yeah. So, so we'll just set it up. The, obviously the Nuggets won the championship and 
one of our jobs, obviously, we, we talked about it a little bit. SWAT stands for saving lives, not special weapons and tactics. It's a creed that we have. It's it's the culture of our unit. Um, it's why we've run in the time that I've been here. We run about 250 to 400 high-risk ops a year. Um, and if you look at our need to apply some type of force to somebody versus our operational tempo, it is, it is incredible. And, and I wish there was never a time, ever, ever, ever a time that there was any force used against anybody. Um, that doesn't always happen. We do everything we can. That's just, we go into a situation thinking, how do we mitigate this? How do we make it so everybody walks away? No questions asked at the end of it. Um, but, so we're in the unit and that's our philosophy. We we're there to keep the community safe and we, we want the community to, to enjoy. This is a huge event. We, we want the celebration of the city. We want the celebration of the state, but we also know that we can, we can start listing names. We can, it happened in Kansas city. You know, it was after ours, but the mass shooting, you have the Vegas incident at the concert, uh, the Boston bombing. And we we could go down a list of 20, to 50 different types of large crowd events where there's been some type of a, an active threat. So they put us out there in order to mitigate that. And, you know, we're up there front and center and we are very public. We want, we want people to see that there's a, there's a team out there, professional team that is ready to respond because we don't want anything to happen. So, so we're, we're there to make it so that people understand Makes me feel safe, but it also feels like a polite deterrent. Right. To, yeah, and to, that's a good way to put it. To, to we, we, we are a very polite deterrent to yeah. know that we have, we have people there and, and you're, yeah. seeing, you're seeing the tip of the iceberg yeah. with what you're actually, we're putting out front and center um, because we want to show that we have the ability to do this so, so nobody does anything. Yep. And everybody goes home. We want that million people that they estimated that were downtown that day. Oh, we were there. Yeah. It was It was packed. insane. I've yeah. been to pretty much all the Broncos things. I was to the Avs the year before. And the Nuggets was a completely different animal as far as to, size to of To make crowds. light of the situation, I had four kids on Lime scooters, and one of them struggles with ADD. Yeah. You know, like it was like herding cats Absolutely. And, 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 in in the dense areas that was, you could feel five, 600,000 people in concentrated areas. And then it was kind of like this second tier of another three, 400,000. It was awesome and packed and a little sketchy. Like but, as yep. a dad with four kids, I was in charge of. It was a little like, oh, this is like being in a mosh pit where the lead singer comes up and everyone storms and you're crushed. Or like one of these soccer games in Europe where, you know, shit just hits the fan. And that and that's the unfortunate thing with with crowd and crowd mitigation and why it's if, if you if you took every single police officer, every single sworn post certified person in the state of Colorado we would still not be able to have controlled that totally. crowd because we were still outnumbered by a hundred or a thousand to one. Yep. Um, and sometimes when crowds, you know, there, there's many studies of crowds, but sometimes you get, you get mob mentality or you have any disturbance with large crowds like that and they're wildly unpredictable. Yeah. And these are their heroes. These it's are like, absolutely it's their like heroes. the Beatles, right? Or you know, and and I I can tell you that I don't think anybody came to that celebration wanting anything other than what we wanted at the beginning, which was just celebration to celebrate, to enjoy, to have fun, to 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 watch their heroes get to hoist that trophy and to have the ticker tape parade, mm. uh, and 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 during it, the the last truck had the NBA trophy, it had Joker, it had Jamal, it had the owners, it had um, the Cronkies on there, and that's what everybody's coming to see. So the first 30 or so trucks go by, yeah. and they're seeing, they're seeing a lot of really cool things, but they're not seeing the one thing that they came for. Yeah. And when that happened, and I think people started to realize we're waiting for this big one, mm -hmm. um, 
it ended up making it so the crowd got a little bit restless and from restless we started having people coming across the barricades we just don't have the numbers in order to stop that mm -hmm. and then eventually it became to where the barricades were they weren't even a thing mm -hmm. and the crowd just rushed in on the truck there's a there's a picture i, I do a lot of public speaking now um as a result of of my incident and one of the i'll put a slide up sometimes if i do a powerpoint with it and i'll put a slide up with a picture and we play a where's waldo game and this picture is taken from a high angle and from probably three or four hundred meters away and we actually play a game of where's waldo and i'm asking people to find the eighty thousand pound ladder truck one of the largest apparatuses that the city and county of denver owns where to find that truck in the in the sea of people because that's how many people were surrounding that truck yeah. at that time yeah and if people weren't there there were barricades mm -hmm. but you know you start getting some of your heroes uh michael porter jr coming through and 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 some of the key players but two-time mvp joker and 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 you know batman and robin jamal murray are coming through on this ginormous ladder truck as like the headliner absolutely and on the earlier trucks fans were already skirting barricades and like running along the trucks they were some of them were like trying to throw beers up to players and like it was a super fun but wild that little bit as a dad of you go okay do i have my four puppies you know and and do i need leashes was coming up for me while at the same time you're like we won yeah and 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 that got when that when joker and jamal came around our corner um because we we had been waiting there for a while everything condensed mm -hmm. like it, it it again it reminded me of like some of these concerts i've been to where like the front man gets out and everyone goes bananas and and just pushes up to the stage and if you're not mind your p's and q's you're down and getting trampled yep you know and so so that's exactly what happened and we had we had we had a number of officers inside of the parade route um some on bikes some on foot we had officers doing everything they could as far as crowd control goes but what we had is we had two atvs with four metro guys each so we had we had eight metro guys mm. as as a quick reaction team inside of the parade route and we got called to go back and basically bring this truck approximately nine blocks and get this truck and the people that were on top of the truck to a safe spot and we walked along the side of that truck going half a mile an hour stopping maybe getting up to two miles an hour um fighting through crowds we 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 exactly what you're saying somebody, somebody would throw a t-shirt up somebody would throw a shoe up to try to get it autographed right and then a scribble would be on it and that sh shoe would go down and you would have thought they were fighting for a million dollars a million dollars for <laughs> for for, sure. a, for a for a priceless yeah. priceless relic yeah and and the crowd went absolutely insane yeah. and as this as they saw this phenomenon happening of oh my gosh there's an opportunity for me to get this Close to my this, this t-shirt yeah this anything um the crowds just got bigger and they got bigger yep. and it was our job to keep that truck moving um there was times when we were pressed so hard up against the truck that you almost didn't have to balance or walk because the truck was doing it for you wow. and the crowd was doing it on the other direction. Um, I can think of a number of different times where we're watching people fall next to the truck and we're pulling them out from under the tires, smashing on the truck to try to get the truck to stop so we could get it mitigated and then we're slowly moving on. Um, and we, we pressed on, we, we, we kept moving. Um, I was on the passenger side. Um, I, like I said, I'm one of the sergeants, I'm one of the supervisors, team leaders. So I was trying to be basically the eyes for, for the engineer who was driving the truck, um, on that right side, which is more of a blind side for him. And as we would continue to go down, we were turning from bigger 
we were going like from Broadway to 13th, which is from a bigger street to a smaller street. Eventually we go from 13th and we're turning on to Cherokee, which is from a smaller street to a significantly smaller street. And the crowds are still there with us. And unbeknownst to me or any of the guys that are on the ground, the, the, the tires on that truck come out two to three feet away from the frame of the truck. So when we've been walking in a straight line or when we've been even in a, a small turn um, with less degrees, when we're next to those tires, we, we, were, we were safe because the tires were in line with the frame. But not knowing that they're coming out two to three feet, we've been walking against the truck, like I said, or, you know, 18 inches away from the truck, and we've felt incredibly safe the whole time. So as we're walking along the side, I'm up at the front, and unbeknownst to me, that tire is turning. It's coming wickedly far out from the frame, and as I go to take a step with my left foot, my left foot doesn't move. And I look down and I realize that this thing has caught my foot and we're going slow and I'm realizing I'm done. Like I'm not done as far as my mitigation and my ability to still protect myself and my life, but I'm done as far as your foot is caught. I am not getting this foot out Mm. and it is, loud beyond what i it it would Mm. it would be like standing on a tarmac with an airplane taking off as far as the the noise of the engine there was sirens going off the massive crowds the cheering all that kind of stuff communication with the engineer was impossible and we were not on direct radio comms with with the engineer either there there was there was um a couple of different channels being used that day. So I couldn't get on the air to mm. have anything would have had to been relayed to the driver that was four feet away from me, but didn't realize that I was pinned and being sucked underneath this truck as, as it's going. So I feel it pulling me under and as it's going, I'm starting to feel all of the injuries. It's an 80,000 pound truck. Um, and it's starting to take my foot and I can feel it crushing every bone in my foot. Um, I can feel, I I've been in sports. I've been in the unit. I've done all of these things. So between injuries that have happened to me, I've seen horrific injuries on people, um, all these kinds of things as I vividly remember as, as this thing is slowly going and having a, not, not an understanding of anatomy like you as a doctor would, but I haven't an, an, enough of an understanding of anatomy. I was like, okay, that part just got lost. And mm. okay, I just lost that. And like I, literal, that's my toes. That's the, my foot that, bones. That, yep, that's yep, my ankle. Yep. I, I, I'm feeling all of this happening as it's going because we're going slow, as I said. So it was at the point where I was feeling this incredibly tight pressure my foot is gone at this point as far as being crushed and I liken it to a champagne bottle being popped. I can actually feel this pressure and I realize this snap and pop happens and it's my foot being ripped off my leg. Mm. Um, and at this point I'm still completely conscious and I'm, I'm actually going through some phases of how do I, save my life because if this thing continues to go on the trajectory that it's going um if it gets into my knee it's going to get up into the higher parts of those major arteries in my leg that haven't branched out yet um and there's a good chance i'm going to die on the street here certainly if it gets into my hip there is no conceivable way that i'm going to uh, that i'm going to survive this um but i'm also thinking right now right here My first thing is, is if this, if I stay standing, if it gets into my tib and my fib and I'm standing, if it twists those bones and takes them the way that I think it's going to do, then 
all of those major arteries that are, you know, below my knee are going to be shattered and um, ripped apart. And again, there's 25 to 50,000 people surrounding this truck. How are we going to, how are we going to get me to the hospital at this point? So between 30 years of jujitsu, 20 years almost um, in the unit, everything slows down and I figure out a way to kind of position myself such that the truck ends up in a trajectory of basically taking everything within an inch of my knee. I'm able to get low so it doesn't, it goes over the tib and fib, but every piece of soft tissue from an inch below my knee is gone. So the truck stops because officers realize that I'm pinned underneath it. But instead of rolling completely over my leg, it stops while it's still on top of my leg. So then they have to back the truck up because they thought, let's just back, let's back, let's back it up. Instead of just go forward four more inches, they back the tire up. And when they back the tire up, there is a state patrol because we now had more resources coming. The, the further we went in the parade route, the more we were starting to get more resources uh, to help to help us with with getting this truck back to where we needed it to go, so it rolls over a state patrol bike. The officer, thank God, was able to get off the bike, but the bike is there's it's actually sitting at the state capitol right now, and it's it's a twisted piece of metal of where the truck rolled over the tr the, the the bike. But as it's doing that, it doesn't go far enough in either direction to free me, so it's still continuing to roll over my leg, the wheels are turning, they're rotating, and my leg is pinned, and I'm, I'm as conscious as you and I here today watching this happen and thinking, are you, get this thing off me, get me to a hospital right now, because this is not how this ends. Like, this, this doesn't end this way. So eventually they're able to get the truck off of me, and my guys, um, we had metro guys and then other, like I said, other resources came up. And most officers in the Denver metro area are trained with like TCCC, um, tactical combat casualty care. Uh, we all carry tourniquets. Everybody has understandings of how to use those. And the, one of my guys comes up and he just looks at me and he goes, tourniquet? And I'm thinking, y yes, tourniquet. So they get the first tourniquet on and it doesn't stop the bleeding. So they throw the second tourniquet on. The second tourniquet stops the bleeding. Um, but I'm looking down at my leg at this point, and it's, it is, like I said, it's, it's gone. I, I understand what, what has happened. And not to be graphic, but it's attached, but it, totally crushed. It's attached, totally crushed. And, yeah, yeah so, so, so it's, not like dang, it's not like in another area. Yeah. But. Right. Think it's, of, it's like a bag of skin. Right. Think of. Think of having a pantyhose on and you've stretched the pantyhose an extra two feet. It's oh still gosh. part of your, it's still on your, on your body, but there's a massive amount of it that's not there and not attached anymore or, or attached, but not functioning in any way that the body is supposed to look. So that's, that's what I'm dealing with. So, so I've ridden with the ambulance. Mm -hmm. A lot of people pass out right. with that level of visual yeah um and you're having like conversations um, with your yeah. team on exactly what we need to do correct um again jujitsu is amazing you put yourself yeah. in these incredibly uncomfortable uh, uncomfortable situations I, I can't tell you I, I mean i've passed out a number of times trying to like get to that last second of how do i mitigate this how do i get out of this mm. um in the unit, I have no idea how many times I've been shot at in the unit. Mm. It's just, it's, it's just, I mean, that's just part of what we do. And when we're getting shot at, obviously, unless it's like right there and in front of us, if we've mm -hmm. put ourselves in the position that we want to, which means we're behind good cover, we're mm -hmm. in a spot where we can, we, we can not have to respond. Like I talked about earlier mm. with immediate use of deadly force. Um, that's what we want to do. And, and oftentimes we we go through situations where we're in massive high stress 
but we're able to slow things down and we're able to make it. Yeah. So at the end of that insane incident, we put handcuffs on somebody, we walk out and but you've probably go. also seen some grotesque i i, I have i i that you're maybe conditioned absolutely more. i i can't tell you how many times that i've had the unfortunate need to step over a body mm -hmm. to go search for mm -hmm. whatever type of threat there was um yeah there, there's there's literally nothing that i can think of that i haven't seen in 28 years of law enforcement as far as injuries to the body. So for me, yeah, this it's, it's me, but mm -hmm. okay. I'm still wow. alive. The tourniquets are working right now. So <laughs> without, without sounding too, too lame, I guess. Or dismissive. Dismissive. Yeah. yeah. That's a much better word for it. I'm like, okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay. This is yeah. now, now we just got to figure this out. Wow. Which is really when I talked to you about an accident, you said an incident. Yeah. Then I started understanding your brain and the training. Yep. And some of the stuff. We'll talk about Project Kaboom, where like you practice what you preach to be ready for this. Absolutely. But when the storm came, you and those who you were surrounded by knew what had to happen. Right. We 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 just went into we just went into action. We we did what we do all of the time 400 times a year and when we're not doing ops we're training for ops so that's what yeah. we do so uh anybody who's been in the military or any type of law enforcement or anybody that just we can even dumb it down if you have something that's very very particular to you in your profession or in hobbies that you have and somebody just came up and started destroying that, cutting it off of you, or taking your tools and just mm -hmm. messing your tools up, you would take offense to it, right? Mm -hmm. So they're coming at me, you would, from from an EMT standpoint, you guys carry scissors, and mm -hmm. those scissors are usually not to cut parts of the body, but it's to cut mm -hmm. things away from the body yep. so you can see the injuries. And I was taking serious offense to anybody coming after my belt or coming after my kit. Mm with scissors because this wasn't my last stop mm. and i've spent 19 years with Burning this <laughs> the, 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 i i yeah. i can take my kit in absolute blackness and absolute dark and mm. manipulate everything on my on my kit wow. i know where every single thing is i know where every zipper is i know how to get to all of the tools that i need to get to um so don't, don't touch my kit. It's just that simple. Don't touch my kit. If I'm alive, if I'm conscious, if I'm talking, regardless of whether I have a leg or not, don't touch my kit. Mm. And that's kind of one of the things that was going through my mind is I'm, and then I'm kind of getting mad at this point too, because I'm not mad at anybody, literally not mad at anybody, but I'm just I'm like, man, like this sucks. Yep. I'm, this is I'm not doing burpees for a while <laughs> that, yeah. that, that actually went through my, through my brain. And again, this injury was next level, but all of us have been like your kid falls and hits their head. That genie is out of the bottle. Yep. And it's normal to be like, darn it. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Ugh. Yeah. And also, and we have to deal. And that's how I was. I was like mad, but at the same time, okay. The tourniquets are working for right now. But, but we, we, need, we need to get going on this. So I take my belt off. I take my vest off. It's got my kit on it, all my stuff. And I actually hand it to one of my guys. And my thought is do, do not dismiss this kit. Right. I'll be back. <laughs> I'll, I'll be back. Yeah. And, I, and that's literally mm. when, when people ask, my rehab was starting – as that truck was rolling back and forth and they couldn't get it off, off mm. my leg, my rehab was already starting. I was already like, okay, now what? Mm. I'm going to be back. I'm going to be back in the unit. I'm going to be a dad again. I'm going to be a husband again. I'm going to be a friend and a teammate again. I might look a little different, but let's go. Let's do this. So in addition mm. to being mad because I now have some work to do that I didn't prepare for, not prepare. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting. Yep. I've been preparing for it and we can talk about prehabbing um, sometime if you'd like to, but I just wasn't expecting that 
an 80,000 pound truck during a million person celebration, the largest event in the nation that day, that wasn't on my bingo card. Mm -hmm. Getting shot, I, I've, I've, I've watched buddies get shot. I've obviously seen lots and lots of people shot. Like that's, that was always the expectation. It's gonna be a pursuit. It's gonna be a shooting. Um, we've been caught in fighters before. Like it's totally <laughs> seemingly random relative to the heavy, intense mm -hmm. safety <laughs> dangers mm -hmm. you are going through on, yes. on a regular basis. And as a guy who's been around firehouses, I know that truck. And yes, it is weird how far out the trajectory of those tires go that you can't hear anything, that there's that level of crowd and the tourniquets are working, but you have to figure out the next step. Yeah. So, so yeah, they, they get on the air, they call officer down. Uh, it's surreal. I'm listening. My, my, my comms are on, I'm conscious. So I'm hearing officer down in the radio and I'm like, officer down like oh my gosh when, when when you hear that immediately your heart rate just starts going like all right where are we going where are we going and and they're they're calling that for me <laughs> and i'm like uh you're you're half neanderthal half avenger half human being <laughs> <laughs> it's you yeah so you, so i'm like yeah. oh my gosh they're calling me the officer down oh and gosh. yes i guess that's true but I, I just need to get to the hospital. That's all yeah. I need to do at this point. Yeah. So um, anybody that's familiar with the Denver metro area, uh, there's an ambulance at 13th and Broadway. We're at 13th and Cherokee. That's three blocks. Mm. In any normal situation, that ambulance is scooped me, and I'm in the back of it in 15 seconds. But there's thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people between me and that ambulance. Mm. So my guys jump into action. We have an ATV and they load me into an ATV that's not designed to carry people. It's not an ambulance ATV. It's not, it's not equipped like that. So they just load me in and get my leg of, or what's left of my leg as much as of in the ATV as they can. And I actually have to hold on to the rails because we're not all fitting correctly. And I'm holding on to the rails of the ATV and I'm using my upper body strength to keep myself in as guys are trying to hold me in. Um, we had motorcycle officers that immediately heard the, the uh, call for officer down. So they were already formulating a plan to go from 13th and Cherokee to 8th and Spear where mm. Denver Health, the best level one trauma center in the region is. And so they're coming up with a plan and people are going into action. Uh, the one thing that didn't happen though, because I wasn't transported in uh, Denver Health ambulance is that Denver Health had no idea what was going on. They didn't know what was coming through the door. So they, they get greeted at the ambulance dock with six motorcycles, two ATVs, dudes with machine guns and explosives and flashbangs, and one guy holding on to the ATV that doesn't have a leg. So at that point, I'm alive, I'm still conscious, and I'm, as I've done maybe even thousands of times in my career, just not well I've, I've been there multiple times for for injuries but never a critical injury um but we go through the we get to the dock and as soon as they realize what's going on just like our guys had done they go into their emergency protocol and and here we go and it was incredible to watch their staff do their thing and get this get this thing rolling or are you straight to the OR? I'm straight to the ED mm -hmm. because the tourniquets were working. Mm -hmm. uh, I was blessed in the fact that Dr. Moffrey, who is a world-renowned surgeon, he's the director of orthopedics. Um, obviously, he specializes in trauma at Denver Health. He's he's actually making rounds that day. Not, he, he's he's not he's not a, he's not in surgery. He's not doing clinical work or anything like that. As the director, he's just walking around the hospital and checking the hospital. And 
he's in the ED as I come through the door and he sees me and immediately is like, yep, I got this. So, um, at that point, my wife had been called. She was sick. I was hit at 13th and Cherokee. Anybody knows the Denver police headquarters is at 13th and Cherokee and where her office was, was right outside of where I was pinned underneath that truck. So there was actually a number of people in her office that day watching and filming the parade route and they saw me get hit and they saw me get pulled under that truck. So probably before the truck was even off of me, one of them had made a call, hey, there's a Metro guy underneath a fire truck. Yeah. And uh, so she's, she texts me. They don't know it's you, they, but they know they, it's your they're, they're, they They know it's me. Mm. They just don't want to be the one telling her mm. that it's me because that's not their place. Mm. So she texts me and hoping for whatever reason, as long as I'm behind cover, I will usually – respond to a text mm -hmm. or a phone call mm -hmm. um while i'm working because a lot of times mm -hmm. we're comboing between team leaders and team commanders mm -hmm. and then those kinds of things so she texts me in hopes that when the text get pulled up the three little bubbles will come up and she'll see that it's not me and that i'm responding to this text and as she's waiting for the three bubbles the screen goes black and it's my lieutenant who's a very close friend of hers as well and worked for her and she knew like immediately it was like yep that's justin he's he's pinned under the truck and is he alive right now like give gives me give me as much info as, as you can so she actually flies downtown um and is able to get there she's mitigating things with the kids this is going out on national TV right now that there's an officer down just crushed by a fire truck. Simultaneously to that, we had two people that were shot right after my incident happened. So all of a sudden, this yeah, unrelated, unrelated, completely yeah. unrelated. But all of a sudden, this went from a celebratory NBA championship into a I don't want to say a national crisis, but definitely a a, a the national story for the day is the events mm. that happened um, in downtown Denver. So get there, Dr. Moffrey makes this decision to keep my leg. He's gonna basically take that sock and put everything back together. And you were in Project Kaboom, which we'll share with our listeners how yep. to watch and all that, but you share, he, you are told it's a crush and degloving. Yep, injury correct can you explain for our listeners what that means yeah so basically short of my tib and fib um everything within like i said about an inch there's actually a couple of scars like on my kneecap um is crushed flat flat as a piece of paper and then most of the soft tissue is pulled off or at least pulled off inside of of some of the skin that's still that's still i don't want to say intact but in ways attached, attached. exactly mm -hmm. um so uh, the reason i want listeners to know that because that was a gutsy uh, impressive move to want to try and i i can tell you put that a sack of dust together that that's exactly it there, there's yeah. there's a number of things that were god things that day but having dr moffrey and his genius and not just his genius but his his desire to do everything he can to save the knee because mm -hmm. he understood the importance of the knee joint mm -hmm. which i didn't know what an ak versus a bk was mm -hmm. I, there was never a reason for me to understand yep. any of that um, and for our listeners, it's a below the knee amputee or so a BKA or an AKA and above the knee. And that knee joint is pretty vital to normal function. If you see me out and I'm wearing pants, you would generally speaking, have no idea that I don't have that. I don't have anything below my knee. Yep. Um, and that's, that's on, that's on Dr. Moffrey. And it um, opens up levels of sports functionality. Me, me going back to the unit, you like, going back to the unit, me, getting around town, everything, everything. everything. This yeah. is, this is, 
This is of all of the things that happened through this journey, that decision at that moment was possibly the one that had the potential to be the most life altering mm -hmm. is him making that decision. Mm -hmm. um, I've been told not, not by Dr. Moffrey, um, because he's such a, he's such a reserved guy as far as this, this dude's I've been around studs before. Yeah. Um, I've been around the top of the top in so many different genres, but this guy, and he'll never tell you he's, he's amazing. He'll never tell you that he is, um, that he is at the level that he's at because he doesn't need to, because he just goes about his job. But, but that's, that's what Dr. Moffrey is. And I've been told by multiple surgeons that have an understanding of my case and my injuries that if I had gone basically anywhere else and not had him, that I would have been, uh, AKA two hours after getting into Denver health wow. that I would have any other trauma center, anything else that I would have been immediately, immediately above, above it's, the knee. It's good to celebrate the best in surgery. I mean, the stamina alone that it takes to do that job. I mean, 16 hours, Unbelievable. 20 hours. Yep. Sometimes you're clocking out after 32 hours because it's a level one trauma center and you don't know what came through the door. Absolutely. And you're not going home to, you know, binge watch your show. <laughs> you're, you're staying there with 32 hours of focus sometimes to make sure someone like you gets the best possible outcome. And, and, and that's what happened. And Dr. Moffrey has been with me for, um, for all of my eight surgeries, he, maybe not as the chief surgeon for all mm -hmm. of them, for the, for the big ones, he was the chief surgeon, but Denver health is also uh, a, a training hospital. So there was times where there was residents and other amazing doctors and surgeons and stuff to be a part of it. But he's been that, that overreaching, not overreaching, but like that overwatch to make yeah. sure that, that this was going smooth. So between Denver health and Dr. Moffrey, I could not have asked for better medical care. Yep. And I was even told a number of times because I, I did get some infections. There, there was, it was about at the nine month mark that, and I, I swear to you on this, the tire marks from some of the tissue that had to stay because if that tissue was lost, I would have been an above the knee. I went about nine months with one day to the next, not knowing whether I was going to keep my knee. Um, so for nine months, you would look at tire marks yes, on your skin? There was still tire marks. I, 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 Dude, that's like Stephen King stuff. I know. Like right? That's, yeah. That is bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. In wow. between, in between every surgery, I would be working out. I would be at the gym. I would be doing things. I started to, to, to figure out like, how do I, how do I take all of my mental anxiety that used to be burned off doing physical fitness this way or by providing for the family or doing hobbies and that kind of stuff. And I just had to like recalculate all of these different ways to do things. And it actually became kind of like a game for me of, okay, I can't do this, but I can do this, this, and this. Mm. And kind of those, those different hits that you get, that adrenaline, dopamine, all of those kinds of things that your body is craving and that I used to get this way or that, I just had to relearn how to do things to make it mm. so that I felt like I was accomplished. Like getting down the stairs, eating correctly, being able to endure my ice, or my leg packed in ice for 10 of the 12 hours of the day, just because I knew ice kept me off of narcs, ice kept the swelling down and mm. ice was increasing the, um, healing, the, the healing time. So, so real quick, as we get into mm -hmm. recovery and, and project kaboom and all the other cool stuff. So our listeners don't get lost. Yep they try and save the leg they do try to save the leg but a week in Wait, so it was actually two and a half weeks in two and a half weeks um in. and 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 part of saving the leg and the, again in in dr moffrey's genius um he knew that 
soft tissue at the base of my knee needed to have some time to heal Mm -hmm. because if we didn't have enough soft tissue there uh, that I, that there's no way that that this was going to work for, for a salvation, obviously, but even for a below the knee amputation, Mm -hmm. we had to be doing something to put as much of that soft tissue below my Mm -hmm. knee together. Here's something that's, that's incredible. Um, and then that a God thing is the soft tissue, an inch below my knee is gone yet. Every single part of my knee, as far as the internal mechanisms of my knee from my patella, the patella tendon, the meniscus, the, ACL. the ACL, all of the tendons, all of the ligaments, everything 100% intact. That's so bizarre. 100% intact. So by building up some soft tissue there and my calf, parts of my calf was actually kind of still there. So they actually had what they needed in order to fold over and to create that residual limb. Yeah. So again, wow. another God thing, whether, whether it was his hands directly or him helping me move into the position that I needed to be in to have whatever type of injury was going to happen. Um, happened and made it so as of right now 15 months into it i still have open wounds 15 months into it Mm -hmm. um that are still healing but i have a fully functioning knee quad ham all that wow so at two and a half weeks and we know with soft tissue and and crushing injury you can have this necrosis or this dead tissue take over and you know he shot for the stars but everyone kind of knew where this was going right he talks to you and says hey if we want to have below the knee we got to take the leg yep so i go in on a tuesday for them to look at it we already had an appointment scheduled for a surgery on a friday um, and that was to do some different types of work on the ankle and immediately that changed into an amputation Mm. and it was exactly what i wanted to hear yet at the same time to actually have a doctor look at you and say i will be taking your leg on on friday so just prepare and i'm anticipating it's going to be a bk but when you wake up is when you'll know whether you have a knee or not wow yeah so we want to make sure people know that you can see your story so well told through some of the call project kaboom yep right and there's so many things i have to say about you and your family and the leadership and metro and for me healing a lot of police and societal relations and realizing how human and beautiful and inspiring uh law enforcement is and like any industry one bad apple can spoil a whole bunch and there's bad lawyers and plumbers who don't do their job right and flood your house and everything in between but when you watch project kaboom you realize that serve and protect is not dead and the interesting things when you're talking about special needs kids is what i've learned is sometimes physical protection sets up emotional safety for people and those kids when they saw that big line on the perimeter making sure everyone got back on the bus we had 11 kids that we came with right that also opens people up to emotionally connecting and sharing and feeling vulnerable and you got through a very difficult surgery Your wife talks in Project Kaboom about she had a cadence of every three minutes. Let's get through the next three minutes. Then it turned into five minutes. Then at two weeks later, she would go into these 15-minute chunks of, is this all going to work out? Is there some semblance of a family and normalcy for us? And you get this guy to reach out, who's a dear friend of mine. And dear friend of mine now, too. (laughs) And and how we met is my uh, younger son, Ozzy, who's Mr. Hoops all day, trains with Steve Hess. And that's when we bumped into each other, was at the gym. (laughs) Yep. But this crazy mofo (laughs) reaches out to you and says, Whatever you're going through, whatever you need, I'm all in. I'm locked in. 
and and so the first the first time I got a phone call from Steve, I didn't I didn't I had seen Steve Hess as this massive personality on TV. Steve's Steve's a little bit short in in, in stature. <laughs> I, I know tall in energy. Yeah, tall in energy, <laughs> short in stature. But you'd see him with these seven feet tall guys, yeah. and Steve was bigger than them as far as yeah. muscular build aura. and everything and, <laughs> and aura and and at the time i remember steve with the dreadlocks and all that kind of stuff and then it took me some time though to put together from the first phone call until we actually met and everything that this was the person that was on the other line yeah the phone just a that, real that, quick yeah. pause button steve, steve Hess was the strength and conditioning coach for the denver nuggets for 21 years yes and He's deeply beloved by the Cronkies. He just got, even though he had left the team, he just got his championship ring and like trained with Joker and Jamal and, and, and the whole crew, right? And he's an absolute powerhouse of the ultimate in setting realistic, accomplishing goals. And, and as you say in one of the Kaboom episodes, blends the art of health, wellness, and fitness, and the science like no one I've ever seen, and then just brings the thunder. If you're not following him on the gram, kaboom! Now you know you you everyone needs their daily dose of Hess to get the most out of themselves. You you have to know about Steve Hess, and <laughs> I, I said at the beginning of this, one of the drives that I had at the beginning, and one of the, my loves was working out. Mm -hmm. My my dad bought me my first gym set. Uh, it was the old like maroon hollow plastic weights that you had to fill with either <laughs> water or <laughs> sand or concrete um, and a bench that probably couldn't support me and the small amount of weights. Um, yeah. But that's what you had back in the day. That's, totally. that's all that was there. Yeah. Uh, so, so my entire life growing up has been about fitness and mm. performance and how do I – how do I make the most out of this body that God has given me? And I thought I was pretty good at it. Like I thought I knew I've, I've had lots of physical therapists, lots of strength and conditioning coaches, lots of different people that have been a part of it. But Steve is the first time I had a performance coach. And I don't call Steve a strength and conditioning coach. I call him a performance coach mm -hmm. because he embodies and encompasses everything that you do mm -hmm. your mental well-being spiritual well-being physical well-being your nutrition your rest your mm. sleep you you name it if there's kind of like you with your with your practice you have to look at all of these underlying things in order mm -hmm. to figure out how to get somebody to this well steve is doing that exact same thing but in a way to get people to be at their peak athletic performance and and just to to plug his brilliance steve was with nuggets for 21 years and then he was chief performance officer at panorama for yes. years and and now it runs viking uh power, power fitness yep. in in and what i love about him is he changed psychos like you who are uh jiu-jitsu players and black belts and swat all the way to the single mom to uh, a kid in the inner city who is trying to get scholarship and everything in between. But he reached out to you and said, whatever you want to do, I'm here. I'm available. I'm at your service. Yes. Are you in? And, and, <laughs> and of, of course I was. And I'd had, I'd already between every surgery I was working out. Be, I was, I would go and have somebody bring me to a 24 hour fitness. They would drop me off cause I didn't want somebody in the, in there with me, but I would wheel around in a wheelchair. I was wheelchair bound for almost seven months and I would transfer myself from my wheelchair to my machine. I had wound vacs, I had tubes coming out of me, all of these mm -hmm. kinds of things. So it was like, yes, let's do this. Let's do this. And then I still had those things going on when Steve got a hold of me, but he then took all of that and put it into programming that made sense and programming to start making it so my progression exponentially increased because of him. And he was there on the first day that I got my leg. He, he you know, the, I got actually, it, it was, I got my leg on January 10th 
and on January 11th because of the things that he had been doing and preparing me for, I walked into Panorama on my new leg that, you know, and, and I was walking and already starting to do exercises with him on the 11th that I shouldn't have been doing because you just, you don't get a leg and then just start exercising with it. But you can do that if you have somebody, and Steve's never worked with an amputee before. Mm-hmm. Like that just shows his incredible ability to understand human performance is, he'd never done this before, mm-hmm. but he just knew, all right, if we do this, this, and this, then we'll get you at a point where once you get the leg, we can, we, we can go. The basics are still the basics, Absolutely. but the, the willingness meets the work ethic with him is really inspiring it's it's incredible and you know i do that more academically and ironically i'll tell you a lot of times i'm training till 2 30 in the morning to try and write a medical paper or to crunch data find that magical keyhole to get someone's physiology back he's often waking up (laughs) when i'm going to bed so once in a while i'll text him something and i know he's like an hour from getting up the dude gets up at 3 30 every morning every morning goes to bed at 9 30 gets his own stuff done yep so that he is locked for his patrons and he just crushes so a a guy like that eventually is going to attract some attention and my understanding of the story is pbs came to him and said we love the way you roll, the way you live your life. You do so much inspirational. You make a living, but you also give back. And we want to do this series called Project Kaboom. And for those who don't know, it's like his moniker is Kaboom. And, and you'll, you'll fall in love with and you'll find your inner Kaboom. And Steve kind of said, I think I have our first potential story if he's up for sharing the story. And my experience with military and police is you actually have story to tell and a lot of times that's not the code or the vibe but then the world doesn't get to know you as human beings they don't know uh the dedication and clarity of on serve and protect and that and and all you hear is the bad press and i am just so grateful that you got vulnerable and opened up your you and your family's home because Everyone needs TV that's worth watching and can make them realize what's possible within their own lives. So when Steve called me and we had our first meeting and and we had, we were, we were going to go sit and meet and we were going to discuss project Kaboom in Metro. We do everything we can kind of a mantra is return neighbor neighborhoods to normal. The faster we can get in, safely mitigate a problem, and then get out and make it so that nobody even knows we were there, that's what we're looking for. Again, we want to do it without anybody getting hurt. We want to do, but, but that we, we're not clandestine by any means. Right, but it, you're trying to avoid but, but collateral we, damage and just get life back to normal. And that's what we want. If, 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 Nobody ever hears about the 400 or so operations that we do in a year. That's absolutely perfect. That's exactly what we want. That means that we were able to do it um, without, without an ending that, that would garner some type of attention. That's what we're looking for. So I've spent 20 years of my life trying my best to be as incognito as possible. But something was happening right around the same time that Steve called me and talked about this is I was now at a point where people were watching my progress. And because this was a national event, uh, lots of coverage, people were starting to recognize that the way that I lived my life prior to this injury was having a direct impact on my recovery, my mental well-being, and my ability to overcome this. And it was starting to garner some serious attention. Um, and I had, I had a lot of sleepless nights, partially because of the, the surgeries and the pain and just learning how to 
learning how to how to be in a bed with the new sensations and all that kind of stuff. And I was coming to realize that I was starting to develop a, a third purpose in life. Um, you know, saving lives was the first one. Once I got married and had kids, that was my second purpose, which is my biggest purpose. Not even it's, and the purposes aren't even close. Like my family is my biggest purpose, but saving lives, obviously a massive purpose in my life. But what I was learning is I, I had a third purpose, which was, helping people get through their troubles, helping people get through some of their difficulties. So when I agreed to doing Project Kaboom, it was not because I wanted to be filmed doing workouts or... A lot of it's super vulnerable. Bro. Right, like right, it, right. I, that, that, that comes through. Like, it's not fun. I, 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 didn't, I didn't necessarily want people in my basement looking at my Lego collection. You, yeah. know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, well, that's funny because I'm like, I'm thinking more like a prosthetic and all yeah. these things. That's, that's intense. Yeah, no. It, and, it, yeah, and kind of private. And, and it was. You know? and, and having been a private person for as long as I have, the reason that... I and my family agreed to do this is because it was a greater good. That's well, it. And I can only imagine too, it allowed you personal growth to share in a new way. Absolutely. With, 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 in, with your service driven heart, like people get more of you. Yep. And you know, there's we're we're starting to watch project Kaboom as family. And just so our listeners know the easiest way to find it is you just put into Google or whatever, how do how can I watch Project Kaboom? And it takes you to PBS channel with Kaboom and there's six episodes that are commercial free. And I put in that Rocky Mountain PBS is my local station. I don't know how it goes if you try and get it from California or, or, or Alabama or whatever, but, and, the, and it's like, you're gonna binge watch because it's, it, when you're having a bad day, there's something in there for everybody of any age, of any level, of any goal, of any orientation, whatever struggle, this is a metaphor or a literal um, display for someone who's going through a prosthetic. I can only imagine the, how, how you are setting a new playbook for how to take an empowered approach to this. But for someone who's going through a different chronic illness or I just, how do I get through chemo and I can't swallow, and I've lost 30 pounds and I need IV hydration to stay alive right now. There's, there's grit and humility and tears and joy and pain and suffering and trial and tribulation. But ultimately, this can-do attitude with my team of friends and colleagues, it's not a go-alone story. You are definitely the hero of your journey, but the... The, your wife, your kids, Steve, uh, Metro, it, it, everything is, is in there for individual grit to communal uh, pursuits and what we need to become a society again, rally around each other, and, but dig deep within ourselves. It's all in there, bro. It, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was very cool. Um, Tom Brainerd uh, was the producer and yep. getting to work with Tom and Elizabeth, uh, they were phenomenal. And yeah, the, the, the final product was, was remarkable. And I will never call myself a hero. Um, you're, you're the one who, who used those words, but it's funny because now what I truly want to do is I want to be a support for people that are going through anything. I really don't wanna be limited into the law enforcement or limited into the amputee world, but I want to be able to help develop people to be heroes in their own story. That's it. Yep, and I think you also invited us to see your wife's in law enforcement. She's she's w been with the PD forever, right? 27 years 27 and she's years. a division chief. So it's like, it's also just good to see like the majority of uh, police are like families trying to live their life and have found this. And, and there's such a crisis where this is a tainted job now and it used to be celebrated. And I think you bring back like normalcy to the desire to, just make sure society is civil and, and, and safe and everyone can go about their day and, and pursue their goals and dreams. 
and that that comes through there's just so many layers to it it's amazing so i know you got to get to another one of your low-key jobs of protecting um all of us at denver broncos today and that that's one of the things your, your team does now is is go to some of the bigger events and make sure everyone's having a good time but i do want to announce uh, I, for people who want to watch project kaboom your tangible goal that you set with steve hess was to get back on the unit sub 12 months. Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna say what happens. You'll have to watch. Okay. Um, and that, um, and tell people how we can find you. I know you got a couple Instagram handles. Yeah, right? so I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. um, just Justin Dodge. And then I'm on Instagram at Heavy Victory. So you can either type in Justin Dodge or you can type in Heavy Victory and look for Justin Dodge on that. Um, and then I have a website because I'm starting to do a number of speaking engagements. So you can also find me at heavyvictory.com. Uh, so there's a number of different ways. And like I said, I, I am really enjoying this part of now sharing my story and helping people get through things. So whether it's, I spoke to a, a, a large crowd, uh, just a couple of days ago, but I also, have no problem i have people all of the time i'm struggling with x y and z do you have five minutes and i, I make time for for everything in between